All right, uh, welcome back. This is turn four. Let's jump right into it. First, a little bit about the structure of this game. You might see it says one day and zero hours until next hosting. Uh, there are 20 real people playing this game. Turns take, depending on how fast you are, somewhere between five minutes and nobody really has ever spent more than two hours except me, I think, on a single turn of this game. And right now there's a timer that turns over every 26 hours. This is actually the second turn we've had today, so very exciting news. All right, let's see. What's going on? Messenger telling us about Homestuck. Thank goodness. And an unexpected event. Okay, let's see. Uh, we found the lair of a hideous troll. Got some free gold and some free magical gems. That's awesome. So nothing bad has happened to us despite taking misfortune. This is a good time to talk about scales. So the scales are these candles are the area of the map over which my pretender god is exerting influence. So everywhere that is in this little outline or that has these little white candles on it, we can still see a dark candle down here, is affected by my pretender god to be a certain way. I talked about it a little bit before, but here we go. My dominion has on the order or turmoil scale order, which is bonus income, resources, less random events, less unrest, more recruitment points, productivity, which is more income and more resources, heat, which takes away some income and some supplies. Um, it does that seasonally. Uh, the map itself changes temperature from hot to cold, which then is added to your hot and cold scales. So in the summertime, it's like it's midsummer always, or even a little bit worse than midsummer always, but in the winter it's warmer than it would be, so you actually get a little bit of a benefit, kind of. We want to get that air conditioning thrown. It's real hot and it's bad, but had to pay for these other scales somehow. Again, we'll go over point by, but way later. Um, growth. More income, more supplies, and population grows over time, 0.6% per turn in all of our provinces which means that our income is going up over time as well because population directly contributes to income uh, linearly. Misfortune 3, 15% uh, chance increased of random events, 30% more chance that the event is bad. Uh, Magic 2 is plus 2 research points for all of our researchers. It also means enemies in our dominion get minus 1 magic resistance, and all mages casting in our dominion get minus one fatigue per spell, I think. Uh, I'm not sure if that's minus one or minus two on the last one. But anyway, so that's what our dominion is like. Now, the reason I picked these numbers is that they're going to help us make big armies. And the reason I picked heat and misfortune was to pay for the other ones. But also because cultivi cultivating and attempting to become an immortal and uh, become a god as a mortal wizard is a sin against the heavens and they will try to punish us with misfortune however they're not going to punish us, us with that much misfortune as you saw over here not only because we took order and some other good scales but also because ill winter kind of messed up the balance of the scales for this game they were pretty well balanced in dominions 4 so i'm hoping they'll figure out that they did it wrong at some point but one of the big things that they did is a lot of the good events used to require you to have luck and a lot of the bad events used to require you to have misfortune. So the table of like 10,000 events that it rolls on constantly every turn when it has a random event for you would have a lot more good things in the table if you were lucky and a lot more bad things in the table if you had misfortune. But now a lot of those prereqs got stripped off because they thought that taking a combination of turmoil, which is less money but more events, and luck together was too good, I guess. Um, so basically right now misfortune is not quite free points but definitely less of a suicide pact than it was in Dominions 4. All right so let's take this turn. Uh, we're going to talk about forts later. We're going to start recruiting a different wizard probably this turn. We'll see how much of our money we can spend before we get to wizards but so we've got some options. Um, this commander can come down here, but there won't be a full army's worth of guys there. So let's actually send him up here to grab these guys. And we might as well try recruiting 
some deer tribe archers. So he'll have three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He'll have eight archers and nine archers and eight guys in a front line. That might be enough to take this province if we're lucky or careful. Or we can trade those off, give them to our prophet, take our prophet over this way. That might work. We're going to give that a try. Uh, we're going to leave this militia here. His job is to keep this province safe. Um, we're going to send this army down into this swamp. There are 30 guys there, but we've been building up some people here, so we have a fair number now. Um, maybe it would have been better to leave those archers in place and take them up north next turn, because this guy can only really command two squads, so I have to do something weird with these archers. We're going to mix them in with our infantry, which is a bad idea, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, we're going to go down this way. Um, we won't have magic support because this is just an ordinary commander. And we won't have uh, any sort of fancy formations. Again, because his leadership isn't good enough, you need to have plus one for at least up to three squads, and he's plus zero for up to two. Um, we're just going to have a block of guys and another block of guys. Hopefully, uh, the idea here is that these ones will stand around, the archers will shoot a little bit, and then they will charge into melee, and hopefully the archers will not just perish. Do they have a weapon? They have a short sword. That's not so bad. How we just this guy? Okay. Uh, you can hit W to... Oh, interface. Uh, this game has a pretty bad interface, but it's also the best the interface for these games has ever been. Um, on any screen, you can hit question mark to show all of the hotkeys that you can do on that screen. Uh, a lot of the subscreens have hotkeys. Uh, the research screen has hotkeys that let you filter it by different paths. Um, all right, this army is going down here. Going to kill these guys, take this swamp, get some more resources so we can start making more dudes. Uh, then we'll see what's around this way we'll probably start working our way this direction. Um, I don't know how close any other land players are. I obviously have figured out that there's a water player over here, but I'm not sure if we have time to sort of build an empire or if we're going to be at war very shortly. We're going to keep sending... Uh, we want these lizard guys. Um, they're useful lizards. Um, but let's, we're going to send this spy over this way. We're going to send this commander up this way. We're going to recruit some deer warrior archers. We're going to make more troops here. Let's see, we're making a new expansion force for two turns from now. So. And next turn we'll have more resources. Um, so these are decent. They're not super terrible cavalry. Um, they're not great, but they're good enough for flanking. And they have bows, composite bows, which is nice. Um, these guys are substantially better. They have 15 protection instead of 10, which if you look at the kinds of damage numbers things do, uh, most so it's getting stabbed with a spear or something probably does 10 or 11 damage. So having 15 protection means it usually won't hurt you, and having 10 protection means it usually will hurt you, but not fatally. Um, we could also try to grab... No, those guys are too big until we have resources. So let's... Uh, the cheap cavalry are going to continue to be... Let's just go cheap cavalry and archers, I guess. Or just cheap... Big pile of cheap cavalry. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12... That would almost be enough to take this province and then maybe that province, but we'll give him two turns so that this guy can take over building this palisade. And yeah, we're just going to start massing horsemen. So, and then let's stop making these guys. We have 179 this turn. That's actually not enough for a bigger mage. Um, yeah, that's not worth it. Um, I keep saying we're going to stop making these guys. We'll make a few alchemists of the five elements. They're just as good at researching. They have disease healer, and they have more cross paths. So. And they're pretty cheap, I think. Yeah, 
20 more, but that's not bad. So we're going to make one or two of those. Mm, no, I really want to start getting alchemists and five elements out. So we're going to get one of imperial alchemists out. I mean, we're going to get one of these, and then after that we'll get one of these. Um, but that means we're going to run out of money before we run out of resources, so we will make some archers. All right, that seems good. Uh, and then I guess that's really it for this turn. That's pretty short. So let's just, I haven't looked at pretender titles at all, so let's do that real quick. Um, all right, so these are all the pretenders in the game. Here we are. My path to ascension begins here. We are uh, the Minister of Dreams and the Lord of Eclipses. Those are pretty good titles. Um, and uh, Monkey, who is uh, playing Relia, the civilization of mind flayers that we are at peace with, uh, worships the Pretender Kerbal Space Program, foremost of the Westerners, gatherer of the dead, the hunger without thought. So that sounds good. I'm glad that we're not going to fight him right away. Well, we'd be fine fighting him for the next four turns or so. Uh, it's late summer in the year zero right now. Each turn is a month. So we have had early spring, spring, late spring, early summer, midsummer, and now this is late summer, which means this should be turn six. And by my count, it's turn five. So maybe I'm counting wrong, but uh, that's weird. I'm sure I'll figure that out someday. Anyway, I think that's just about the turn. Let's look to see if there are mercenaries we want. Uh, fishermen, we're going to let uh, the underwater people have the underwater in return for them letting us have the land, which is a good deal from my point of view. Um, and not that they could stop us probably from taking the land, but they could make it really annoying. Um, Yeah, I think that's everything. All right, so short turn, uh, turn five, maybe six. Do I not understand how time works? Who knows? Uh, let's check how our research is doing. We've got 44 research points that per month. We're researching Conjuration 2. We already have level one, then Conjuration 3 will be after that. So we need 34 more, so we'll be done with level two this turn. And then I think it goes uh, 50, 100, 200. So it'll be from level two to level three will be probably, uh, it would be four turns if we our rate of research wasn't accelerating, but it'll probably be, it, we might get it done in three. It'll be close. Um, hopefully soon we'll have some extra labs and temples to make researchers in and we will have more numbers there. Um, you're looking to increase your rate of acceleration. To do that, you want to build forts and other places that let you recruit more wizards um, because you want to make your way up the power curve as fast as possible. We are on Panko or 4, uh, Vestakis, a Class A Terran world in the Prime Goldilocks zone. Our nearby celestial objects that are labeled are Pancor 5B, Lunatrix, which apparently has artificial structures and life signs, as well as ELSS, which I do not know what means. Uh, and then the larger planet, Pancor 5, Aquarium, the Class A Terran world with adva advanced seaport network and abundant aquatic life. Uh, the green connections are roads, red connections are, in, the red lines are impassable mountains. Um, yeah. Hopefully, I want. I really want to expand off of this planet and see what it's like on this ring world or these moons, but we got to secure our immediate surroundings and start building more armies and more wizards first. That'll do it for turn five. Thanks so much for listening. Sorry that I didn't think of anything to talk about and just rambled on for a bit there. I'm sure there's something I said I was going to talk more about in a past turn I could have covered, but we'll get to it eventually. There's going to be a lot of turns. I'm betting at least like 73.
it's a game where anything can go wrong some of it definitely will and a lot of it but not all anywhere close to all of it is impossible to recover from so so far nothing has appeared to ruin our day and we're hanging in there we're gonna keep trying to play as greedy as we can and push it close to the limit let's see how we do all right thanks for listening and have a great night it's getting pretty late where i am oh yeah one more thing so this is a beautiful map and it was created very carefully by someone for 14 land nations and four water nations. We are actually playing it with, I think, 15 land nations, maybe 16 and three water. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Okay, so I think we have 15 land nations and three water, which means that the start locations are messed up. Uh, specifically, what it means, most of all, is that somehow um, Pythium and um, who are basically Byzantine Roman serpent worshippers, although they're not very Byzantine yet in this, but they are the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, in late ages, they'll be more serpent worshippers than they are now. Uh, Pythium and uh, Nazca, which is a kind of South American inspired uh, undead using bird people mummified landlord nation. Uh, we'll talk more about them if I ever actually meet them in game. Um, started with adjacent capitals and apparently have been involved in a hell war since turn one. So it's good that I didn't start over there, I guess. And also, when someone says they made a map for a certain number of players, either play it with that number of players or embrace chaos. We went for the embrace chaos option. Uh, let's finish our tour of the solar system, too. Here's Pancor 3. It's a Class B plus jungle world. Uh, recent Dark Ages event, hazardous wildlife. Uh, this is Ueto7338. Uh, it's Olympias ring world, functional ELSS. No Forge Signature, Primitive Population, Abandoned. Uh, Pancor 2, uh, Viperii, Class C Desert World, Only Highest Elevation Hospitable, Eco, Eco Dome Cities, Sand Barge, and Wind Ports. So, this is a cool one because the desert planet I think is really beautiful. Um, there's a cave planet up here, Pancor 1. I guess this is the closest to the sun, or maybe they're numbered. Yeah, I guess this is the, supposed to be the closest to the sun. I thought it was going to be, huh, because it says it's a warm corpse, core effect. So you would think that it would be cold and far away, but uh, Pancor 1, Sepulcher, Class D, Dead World, Recent extinction event, warm corpse core effect, life signs detected. Maybe the whole thing is just in weird perspective. Let's look at the... All right, let's see. Uh, so it looks like... Yeah, that looks like Pancor 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And this moon, that moon, let's see. So there is... Oh, that the moons are not on this map, so I can't tell whether this moon rightfully belongs to me and Pancor 4 or wrongfully belongs to Pancor 5. All right, that's a tour of the solar system. Uh, look at these rings. Look at this cave planet. The only habitable parts of it are these several caves inside below the surface. I wonder what's up with these little moons this one <laughs> this is a water moon that's crazy that's gonna be such a pain for somebody i bet all right anyway um that's the turn have a great night